Welcome everyone to today's webinar. As promised, we've got two great stories to tell you from two really cool companies, Flexco and National Gypsum. This is the 15th installment in our series, Transparency is the New Green in Product Selection and Specification. So this webinar series features building product manufacturers who you can find in the Transparency Catalog. And the stories that you're gonna to hear today are a standard format. So every webinar that you come to in the series, you're gonna hear the manufacturers tell the story in a similar flow, and they're gonna be interesting and relevant whether you're a manufacturer or an architect, engineer, contractor, or owner, so that everyone can really understand the commitment, the energy, the time, the risk, and the cost for manufacturers to not only invest in product transparency, but to actually invest in making higher performing and greener and healthier products. I like to start out by setting this context that product transparency does build credibly greener brands, but not just by producing disclosures. So gone are the days where just checking the box really is just enough because most building product manufacturers in the very competitive master format divisions, such as this one, division nine, which they're both in, have a lot of product transparency disclosures. What really differentiates a brand is when they can tell stories about what they're actually doing inside the organization, in their facilities, to improve and make plans to improve and be able to explain what that means relative to how the disclosures are delivering results. That kind of trust is what builds really powerful brands and powerful brands are what create preference and value for their companies. So here's the agenda for today's webinar. We'll do a quick introduction to Sustainable Minds and the Transparency Catalog. I'm Terry Swack, the founder and CEO of Sustainable Minds. Then we're going to go right to Ann Doherty from Flexco, and then to Amy Hockett from National Gypsum. We're going to do a demo of the Transparency Catalog, both manufacturers' content, how to use the catalog to be able to find products and manufacturers super easily. Uh, whether in your early stage design or you're into the specification phase. At any time, you can put a question into the questions panel. Jennifer Larkin uh, is in the background moderating the questions and will get them to us to get them answered either during the session or at the end. Any question that you pose that doesn't get answered during the session will definitely reach back out to you. Get those questions answered. The webinar is being recorded. And tomorrow when we send the follow-up email, you will get a link to that recording. And you will also be able to request a PDF of this presentation deck if you so desire. And with that, a little bit about Sustainable Minds for those of us who are new to us. Uh, we're a cloud software company. Our focus has always been in the environmental space, building two product families to help manufacturers design and now market greener products. We have deep expertise, both in life cycle assessment and material ingredient uh, disclosure, as well as uh, cloud software design. Uh, when I founded the company over a decade ago, we were able to have Autodesk, invest in the company and get us off the ground and really launch the category of sustainability software. Today, we are the only end-to-end -end product transparency solution provider in the market today. We are an ISO 14025 type three EPD program operator. As I said, we deliver LCA and material evaluation services, and we've developed a whole family of transparency reporting tools that help building product manufacturers take those stories and the results from the disclosures to integrate product transparency into product marketing 
So for building professionals looking to select and specify products for greener and healthier high performance buildings, we've made it super simple for you to find all the brands in North America across all master format sections, investing in product transparency. And in fact, there are so many manufacturers today, finally, in 2020, you'll see there are over 1,400 building product manufacturers and industry associations now across more than 750 master format sections. The other key point we like to make uh, before we dive into these stories to contextualize it even more is that environmental performance and material health are performance criteria that sit alongside functional performance, cost, aesthetics, safety. They're criteria that people use to make decisions about products. But we believe in Sustainable Minds that product transparency information should not be delivered separate and apart from all of the other content people use to make decisions like functional performance, aesthetics, specifications, safety. All of that should be delivered uh, together because people make trade-offs to make decisions. And everybody has their own methods for making trade-offs. But the primary purpose for manufacturers to invest in doing LCAs and material assessments is for their own personal knowledge to be able to benchmark where they are, understand what's contributing to those impacts or to the material risks and hazards so that they can plan for improvements uh, in, an, in an ongoing way, which is what really the industry is looking for. And then only secondarily are LCAs intended to be used to create EPDs and material ingredient disclosures used ultimately to be public facing. But the primary purpose for manufacturers is to understand how their products are performing. So then they can improve them and tell those stories. And so the transparency catalog is really designed to revolutionize green building product selection specification. So you can find those brands and reward them by selecting and specifying their products. As I mentioned, there are over four, 1,400 companies today, and we're going to do a quick demo at the end of the two presentations today to show you how easy it is to find manufacturers and their products. And you're also going to see how we've created a standardized template for each manufacturer to tell their story, their market position, for you to be able to contact them any way that they want them to be able to have you contact them. Uh, and here at the core of the listing is the product table where manufacturers have organized their products. It's a matrix organized by master format section horizontally. And then you'll see uh, when the listing opens up, all the products in that master format section. These are going to link to the manufacturer's website. And you'll be able to see in a glance which types of product transparency disclosures they have for each product. You'll be able to link and get to each of those disclosures. And in a glance, you're going to be able to see the results of that information uh, in a very high level way. So you can uh, drill in or not, uh, but know um, what they've got for that product. We'll take an even deeper dive. There's some interesting social media tools that make it easy to share access to the three-part specs, which is going to make it really easy for you to spec. You can see correlated with the master format section. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Ann Doherty, who will tell us her story and the story of Flexco's Greener and Healthier Products. Thank, Thank you. you. Take it away. Thank you. Hey, I'm Ann Doherty, General Manager of Sustainability for RHC family companies, Flexco, American Made Flooring is a part of RHC. And PE there stands for Professional Engineer. I'm a registered engineer. The 
journey to sustainability to becoming a sustainability general manager. Let me just tell you really quickly background uh, education, chemical engineering and bachelor's and a master's in manufacturing engineering, and then 35 yikes years of work experience. My current responsibilities are for RHC and Flexco, sustainability, GPO, which is group purchasing organization contracts, and writing CEUs, uh, continuing education units. We are not a big company, and so I have the opportunity to wear many hats. My path to Flexco has included consulting, you know, the hazmat suits, cleaning up Superfund sites and designing air treatment systems my first nine years, and then went to work for a trade association, Portland Cement Association, representing cement and concrete in outside of Chicago and Skokie, Illinois, founded my own company, which is a tourism company, which worked on uh, food education. We did farm tours, farm to table tours, did that for eight years, went to work in a university facility department that was Xavier University in Cincinnati, and now working with manufacturing sustainability with Flexco and others. Why sustainability interests me? Originally, you know, I was a chemical engineer who solved environmental problems. Over time, environmental technical engineering has become sustainability, sustainability as it encompassed community relations, economic issues, and in the last decade, social justice and issues of fairness. Um, it is a, it's a great, great field to be in. The, the company history of Flexco is it was founded after World War II, originally made tires, and then it switched to flooring. It was bought by a British company, and then for almost 20 near, years now, it's been part of Ropey Holding Company. Um, that contract was signed on 9-11, literally, it was signed on September 11th, 2001. The folks who flew to Alabama to sign had a harder time getting home. Um, Flexco is located in Tuscumbia, Alabama. It's part of the Quad Cities, including Florence and the famous Muscle Shoals, which is a celebrated musical place. Who cares about transparency? This is a great, this is a great question. The, um, the people that care at first, and the reason I was hired, were that sales and marketing were getting the calls. How do we fill out this lead form? Do you have this document or that document, EPD or HPD or floor score? So the calls, the questions were coming in and everything that's got a question mark after it here is because there were questions coming in from our customers from the outside. Then the folks who um, keep track of the calls and emails coming in, the customer service reps got the call. So it wasn't just the field representatives, it was now the service reps answering questions on a daily minute by minute basis, being asked about sustainability questions. And then sure enough, our distributor partners, the folks who carry our products everywhere on the continent around the world, were getting the questions about sustainability. When it really started to dig deep into our organization is when operations got more involved. So now we're talking new formulations and we're talking how do we make these products differently? And I especially want to call out our chemists, our chief chemist, especially, and the sustainability staff. We have one coordinator in Tuscumbia, Marcus. So Marcus and Raul, when these two guys got more involved, things started happening faster. And last but not least, when you have a controller who asks questions like, um, what's the right thing to do in this case? How can we serve our customers and the environment better? When you have a controller who asks questions like that, and the, the accountant for our wood division is who tracks all of our utility data for our environmental performance every month. When finance also cares, now you really have um, something to work with that can really make a difference in your organization. Because what sustainability means, it includes a sense of place, you know, the community we are in, the people outside who live around the plant, plus the people at the plants, right? Uh, here you see um, Sheila on the right who does quality and on the left, Gary running a, a PVC, a vinyl calendar. Plus, plus sustainability is also the economics of selling, making and selling our product, plus the environmental issues, it's all of it. But part of the reason 
I started with the people on the slide is it starts with the people. Sustainability is the people. So here's our thought. Um, we are, our goal is to responsibly manufacture a durable product. This is where we're going with FlexGo from, to get from point one to point, point A to point B that limits the need for replacement. And the key words here are durable and responsibly, right? Because it isn't simply about reducing stuff in the product. It's also reducing the number of times that products have to be replaced. So let me talk a little bit about product transparency. We have HPDs, that's Health Product Declarations. We did that first and we did it for all of our products. And then the EPDs, the Environmental Product Declarations have followed. We did floor tiles first. Now I'm doing wall base and then I'm gonna do stair treads. Um, and we'll come back to this in, in a minute. We'll talk more about especially the EPDs. Here's some of our products that have these transparency documents. So case study number one, and I am working on the another life cycle assessment now for this product, and I'll tell you why in a minute. The EPD is available now for Tuflex. It took two years of research to learn how to take high quality waste like sanding dust from our processes. It was already vulcanized rubber, right? And make a new vulcanized product out of it. That is what this Tuflex product is. It's also redless chemical free and it is certified with high recycled content greater than 25% and um, high bio-based content greater than 30%. Uh, and those are certified respectively by SCS Global does the recycling and USDA uh, Department of Agriculture does the bio-based content of 30%. This is amazing product where we, where we are can use our waste from our plants and we can also take back um, materials from facilities that are bringing material that, are, that the old flooring or old wall base or old stair treads are coming out and we make, can make a new product out of it. Our second case study is IMO, that's the International Maritime Organization, our IMO rubber flooring. And why am I mentioning this in a sustainability talk? Well, sustainability, like Terry just said, is also keeping people safe, and in this case, sailors safe, right? The IMO flooring is certified by the International Maritime Organization. It's made in the US. It has renewable content, and it's also red list chemical free, and it also, in a fire condition on board, produces steam, not toxic smoke. Um, this is part of sustainability. It's about people. And our third case study, and just this is something that is true of resilient flooring products, but Flexco rubber and vinyl products hold up to cleaning and disinfecting chemicals recommended for healthcare. That's list N on the EPA CDC website. And because those cleaning and disinfecting chemicals are increasingly used by education and government facilities also, this has become really important in our sustainability story. You know, cleaning, that's separating the dirt from the surfaces. Sanitizing is defined as reducing germs. Sometimes that means cleaning off some dirt and also partial disinfection because the germs have come with the dirt. And disinfecting is the, um, the very serious chemical process of killing the germs. So we have wall base as shown here and beautiful resilient flooring and then also um, some stair treads that some vinyl tile and healthcare on the right hand side all of these products extremely easy to clean and they hold up to the cleaners and the disinfectants so our key learnings and insights the process of doing sustainability that's all of it the environmental performance at the plants developing new products that meet a greater sustainability need of our customers. This process has educated a larger group at the company about our products and operations, right? People all know part of the story. Now many more of us know the whole story. My personal favorite part to do is the EPDs, the Environmental Product Declarations, because they are, um, they take a whole bunch of information and put it together and they're meant to be 
a document that a customer would want to read cover to cover. They're meant to be interesting. Training that we've done has led to improvement, which has led to more training. And I'm going to explain what I mean by that. So in 2016, I set environmental goals, which I'll show you in a minute. And 2016, August, so just about four years ago now, I set the environmental goals for the organization. We achieved our goals, which were set for the year 2025. We achieved them last year. A couple of them we achieved them in just three years. This is a virtuous cycle. We keep improving, we keep learning, and then we have to set new goals because training keeps leaving, leading to improvement, which leads us to more training. Here is our corporate environmental sustainability story. So these were the goals shown on the left that were set in August of 2016 for water, energy, and greenhouse gases. Our goal was 20% reduction in nine years by 2025, something like 2% per year. And for waste, that was reducing the amount of waste that goes to landfill. We wanted to reduce it by 25% total or more like 3% per year. At this point, after just about four years, we have, um, we have achieved these goals and we need to set some new goals. So let me explain. For water, that's the upper left graph. We started in 2015 as this is the annual average. Um, and these numbers go up and down per month but this shows you the trend of the annual averages per year, 2015, 16, 17, 18, and last year. If you start on the left, 2015, it says in that blue bar there, 12.06. That was our water in gallons per pound of product that was used. So for every pound of product that we sold, we used 12 gallons of water to make it. In 2019, by the end of 2019, we were using just under half of that, 5.7 gallons per pound of product. And at the end of 18, the number at the top that says 32, that's what we had achieved as of the end of 2018. All the numbers in green are actually at the end of 2018. So our goal was 20%, we've gotten to 32%. Let me then describe what's happening with electricity, which is the bottom left graph. In order to reduce our water, we installed process equipment called chillers, which allows us to reuse water in the plant, which means we do not have to take water from the aquifer. We are reusing it within the plant before it is discharged safely. It's used to heat and cool, excuse me, it's used to cool the process. Um, to cool the product, the water gets hot, then we cool down the water and then reuse it again. To run the chillers, we use electricity. So. That at the end of 18, we had achieved just under 3% reduction of electricity because we had put in some chillers. We hadn't really reduced much. But at the end of 2019, we had reduced by just over 10% our electricity. It went from 0.38 in 2015 to 0.34 in 2019. So about a 10% reduction. The energy goal is 20%. So how do we claim that we've achieved 20%? Well, upper right hand graph there shows you the gas the, that's the million BTU per pound of product. All of these are per pound of product. They're all prorated. And there, the landfill, excuse me, the gas has gone down greatly. And as of the end of 2019, we have reduced by 37%. So we're saying the combination of gas and electricity, the total joules we've, we've reduced in the plant, are greater than 20%. And because the greenhouse gases come directly off the gas used at the plant, the greenhouse gases have been reduced just from the production part by 38%. And um, even more, if you look at some of our process, our formulation changes. And last but not least, the waste landfill is shown in the bottom right. And we have exceeded the 25% reduction in waste that we want. We're up to 30 or a little bit more, 30% reduction in waste to landfill. And that's over the last four years. As we look at, you know, what do we do with this information? Well, it means we have to write new EPDs to let people know that we've done all of this. Of course, we have to write a new life cycle assessment to document all of this. And then our EPDs will show these improvements. But we've also been able to report our progress through being a member of the LP50, that's the Living Product 50. It's part of the 
International Living Futures Institute. These are the folks that bring us, you know, the red list, declare labels, the Living Building Challenge. And as part of this purely forward group of just around 50 manufacturers, we have a dialogue going with the um, American Institute of Architects and a letter campaign to designers um, saying, you know, this is how we're improving our products. And this is how we are being transparent, letting people know through HPDs and EPDs. Please, designers, please specify our products because we want to be able to keep doing this, right? And then let me just use my crystal ball one more time. As I look at the future of product transparency, I see that education is the key to this, and especially the education of the next generation. So the work that Sustainable Minds does with schools, with design interior, you know, design schools and also engineering schools, because is, is to me the key, because the next generation expects performance and they actually aren't pushing so much for disclosure. They just expect disclosure at this point. And we believe we are, we are prime to, to be able to fulfill their needs. So thank you. Thanks for listening. And I look forward to any questions that come up. Well, thank you, Anne. As always, super interesting. And you guys are really doing very practical and meaningful things to improve your products. And as Anne said, now you need to specify FlexGo's products so that they can make more, continue to be transparent, and reward them uh, for, for doing what they do, which is why we've added the specs and made it easy to uh, specify. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a bit. But I want to turn things right over to Amy from National Gypsum. Amy, take it away. Thank you. Welcome, everybody, and good afternoon. And thanks again to Anne for offering a really good overview of Flexco's transparency journey. Um, as just mentioned, I'm Amy Hockett. I'm the manager of architectural services and sustainability at National Gypsum. And there we go. Uh, my role at National Gypsum is to ensure that the AEC communities have the resources that they need to make informed and educated, relevant building material selections, all based on our products. And this is the team here on the slide that is behind um, this work. They're on the front lines of, of the work that we're doing to engage with architects and specifiers through AIA education and to provide technical information about national gypsum systems, assemblies, and all of our product features. You know, our goal is really to build trusting relationships and to earn the specification placement through this work. And in addition to leading this team, the other things that you see on the screen here are things that are part of my responsibility from industry relationships, developing and maintaining our specifications. And then finally, you know, to connect back to the topic today is I'm responsible to develop and to maintain our product transparency documents. And similar to Anne, like how did I get to this place in my career and, and what happened before I got to National Gypsum? Well, prior to working at National Gypsum, I was practicing architecture for 16 years. So I worked um, entirely in the commercial architecture sector in higher education, uh, civic, institutional, and office project types. Some of the projects that I worked on are here on the screen. And after 2009 recession, I transitioned over to National Gypsum. Um, it has been a transition from being a generalist about products to a specialist in one product category, gypsum board. Um, it's really pretty difficult to be an expert in uh, multiple products when there are so many different products and different product categories installed in commercial buildings. So it's been a, an interesting transition. And to connect this story a little bit back to sustainability, my architecture training did include sustainable design fundamentals, but it really wasn't until I was working at Gensler that I started to align those lessons into professional practice. I worked on my first and my only, I hate to say my only, but my only lead project when I was at Gensler, here it is in the middle with the flags, it was a visitor center in North Carolina. And today I continue to use these foundations to influence the product sustainability messages and platforms that we have at National Gypsum. 
here's a collage of different images that represent a collection of events or influences that have made me a little bit more aware or interested in sustainability and, and also healthy buildings. Um, these have all somehow inspired me or stretched me, challenged me, and made me think differently. Um, especially watching the six classes videos helped me connect better with our R&D and our manufacturing teams as we developed our transparency documents, especially since I didn't have a, a background in chemistry. So there's always more to learn and always more to inspire us. Now, just similarly, a brief, I mean, Anne gave a great um, history of Flexco and for National Gypsum. Um, we go all the way back to 1925. We were founded in 1925 in Buffalo, New York. Our founders developed a process to make gypsum wallboard lighter and stronger and cause the gypsum to adhere to the backing paper. And you can see here, they're doing some tests way back in the day. And their product um, that they were making at that time is what we know as modern wallboard. In 1978, we moved our headquarters from um, Buffalo to Charlotte, North Carolina, where it still is today. And in 2002, we also moved our research and development from Buffalo to Charlotte, and it's now called our Technology and Innovation Center. Um, we also have a fire and acoustics and pr physical properties testing lab, which is called NGC Testing Services, and that's still in Buffalo. National Gypsum has a network of manufacturing facilities around the country. We're fully integrated manufacturer of gypsum board, which is our primary product. We also manufacture interior finishing products, cement board, and high performance roof boards. We have, as you can see on the map, we have 41 locations in North America. And of those, we have three recycled paper plants, which supply 100% recycled facing paper for our gypsum board. We also own seven gypsum quarries, including the largest in the world located in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Our plants are also strategically located near metropolitan areas, which allows us to supply large commercial projects with optimized transportation logistics, which is important for those large projects. You'll also notice that many of our plants are located along the coast for ease of delivery of rock from ships, or they're near one of our quarries, again, making it very easy to transport our main raw material, gypsum rock. Because our products are just one component of a larger assembly, so think, think about that we are part of a wall assembly um, that also has studs and, or a floor ceiling assembly where we are one component of that larger assembly, the systems testing for our products is very important. We maintain a very large portfolio of fire and acoustical tests to verify our products meet code requirements and architect's design standards. The reliability of our products is based on testing our raw materials as well as our finished goods at our Technology Innovation Center and at our testing facility in Buffalo, New York. You can see some of those buildings here. Building Futures is our corporate sustainability website, and we only launched that in 2019, so it hasn't been up very long, but it highlights how we live our commitment to integrity, resource management, and corporate citizenship. The site illustrates how we are going beyond compliance to build a better future for our associates, our customers, the communities where we live and work, similar to what Ann was talking about, our people, and then also the environment. Something that sets National Gypsum apart is our full line of gypsum board that represents all categories for commercially specified products. And this is important because, again, the products that are specified for commercial projects have multiple projects have, excuse me, have a multiple gypsum board from a single source manufacturer. So those products need to come from one manufacturer. And so that's important for us to have that full product line. And we are really committed to offering the products to meet the requirements of high performance buildings. As, as Terry was talking about earlier, that um, 
you know, transparency documentation is one of the components for high performance buildings. Along with the transparency disclosures, also we have a line of purple products that represent our mold and mildew resistance. So those two together, along with many other features, do help us um, be part of high performing products. And we're recognized as a leader in the industry for customer service and product quality. And product innovation is based on the requirements from our customers. So we really are listening to them all the time. Our breadth of systems testing, which is something that I already discussed, is important as well as our mold and moisture resistance. And those are kind of baselines for our high performance products. And from there, we've developed abuse and impact resistant products. So you'll see here as we're going up the, the chart here, we've got some mold resistance and some durability to really help with wall integrity in high traffic areas. And then we developed some sound dampening products. So as you're talking about acu acoustics, we have a product line that's called our Soundbreak XP family, which really helps meet the needs of multifamily and medical facilities or any project that needs higher STC wall assemblies. And in addition to our paper-faced mold and mildew resistant products, which are um, all of these on the bottom here, which are called our XP, we also have a full line of fiberglass-based products that are also mold and moisture resistant and have a 12-month exposure warranty and can be installed before the project is really and completely dried in or the final exterior cladding is placed. All these products can help accelerate the project schedule, which is also important for large commercial projects. These innovative products are you know, developed again with our customers in mind and to provide this full line of products for high performing um, buildings really does help us in the commercial market. National Gypsum has four product lines and we're gonna briefly go over each of those. We have our first one here is our gold bond, whoops, our gold bond gypsum board is our um, paper face and fiberglass face products for interior and exterior applications. And we again offer that with a full line of products to cover all the different categories. This is our Proform interior finishing products to provide ready mix or setting compounds. So to finish the, the gypsum board, as well as textures for complex projects. And we have products for, our, um, well, for contractors really here in this, this case, um, a wide range of options to meet all of the job specific demands and also for regional preferences. Our permabase cement board is a rigid substrate that provides an exceptionally hard, durable surface able to withstand the prolonged exposure to moisture in both the interior and exterior applications. Originally, this product was really for tile backing substrate in wet areas on the interior. And then finally, we have our Dexel roof board product line, which is a high performance mold resistant product that offers structural coverage and flexibility to meet specific low slope commercial roofing applications. So both mechanically fastened and fully adhered. And Dexel can be used as a hard cover board and or a thermal barrier. So we've gone through uh, a little bit about the history, the products where we manufacture, and now a little bit more uh, def definition around product transparency and how uh, we got to our disclosure statements. You know, frankly, um, similar to Anne, those questions were uh, coming from the architectural community and we were being asked by architects through letters and inquiries to be, in order to be considered for specification, we had to have those documents. So those letters and the pressures that were coming from the architects helped us to convince our leadership team that the documents were important and necessary to keep our position in the commercial construction sector. Of course, these requests were also uh, really tied also to the material credit changes in LEED V4. 
because we didn't have a specific department to take on the new responsibility and because the re request, similar to Ann said, was coming from the sales and marketing customer base, we really were um, the department that was assigned to prepare and manage um, the process for these these de declarations and so that fell within my department which is called technical marketing which sits under the sales and marketing uh, department or umbrella and because chemistry isn't my chemistry or manufacturing aren't my core competencies i have to still um, i had to then and i still have to collaborate very closely with um, all the different departments in our company to make these documents a reality you know, at first we received a lot of questions and a lot of pushback, cost, risk, all those things that Terry was talking about at the beginning. But as we continued to educate and explain, everyone did get on board, which is a good thing. And here's a list of the products that we have different that we have disclosures for and which type of disclosures we have. Um, we've selected primarily these project these products at the beginning because they are a broad set of products that are commercially specified. So really good for large commercial projects. And we wanted to be able to contribute to those projects. And we also continue to add products that don't have disclosures. So we still do have some work to do in this, in this arena. Um, we originally selected to publish HPDs. Again, Anne was talking about those health product declarations. And because the open standard is a very accessible and scalable um, platform, we were able to get a lot of products into the marketplace quickly with using that standard. And then also HPDs were widely accepted in the industry. We're excited to be on the transparency catalog. I think we've been there for about three or four months. And as, as um, Terry mentioned earlier, it's just, it's a great tool for project teams to easily find the documents that they need. And so we're, we're, we're glad to be on that in the, in the catalog. Now some, for some fun stuff, we're gonna go over three projects that um, have our products on them that um, were part of our transparency journey. Um, at the time we were receiving all the letters from architects, we were also receiving letters from contractors. And that's similar to how Anne was describing her process is it came first from the architectural community and then the contractors were asking for similar documents because they were being awarded projects that were requiring these disclosure documents. So all of these three projects that I'm going to go over have s several things in common. Um, our products were specified, the contractor had a close relationship with us and wanted to use our products, and then the architect and the and or the contractor wanted to use our products because of the proximity of one of our plants that could service the gypsum board for the project. And then on top of that, another layer was, in some cases, we didn't have the disclosures, disclosures yet that were required when these projects started. So this first project, MGM Resort at, um, and Casino in National Harbor outside of DC, you can just see the National Monument over here in the background, which is kind of cool picture. Um, the contractor was wanting to use National Gypsum and Smith Group, the architect, approved the use of our, our products as long as we could provide um, HPDs or equivalent transparency disclosures. You know, luckily we had HPDs already in development, but we weren't published yet. And so by the time the project was completed, we did have our disclosures and you can see here on the screen, the list of products that we used on this project. And I'd just like to point out again, just the voice of the customer mattered to us and it did help us really get these documents out into the market. This is the Kern Center, the RW Kern Center at Hampshire College in Amherst, Massachusetts. And it was our first living building challenge project. The sustainability consultant, and in this case, yeah, the sustainability consultant, as well as the architect, were heavily involved with uh, product selection early in the design phase. And they um, contacted us and asked us about our disclosures and wanted to know if we had red list free products. Of course, we had also been seeing those letters go around. And we hadn't really dived, we hadn't really dug into to that as much at the time this project was coming online. But from this inquiry, we started working with ILFI, again, International Living Futures Institute, um, to, to prepare 
our Declare label. So we got on board, we selected a set of products that would help Hampshire College with this particular certification. And it really gave us more exposure for future living building challenge projects. So an interesting um, project and it really did get us into that other arena of another disclosure um, type of document that we didn't have before. And this last project is the Harvard Science and Engineering Campus, which is currently under construction. It's almost complete. You can see here that um, this is a fairly recent picture, but it is almost complete. Um, and you know, this is a similar story. The contractor wanted to use our products. We were specified and the disclosures needed to, to be there in order to be accepted. So during the submittal phase, we had a lot of product disclosures that we were working with, but because we'd already been on the Kern Center, we had declare labels which showed the level of disclosure that they were requesting, which was 100 parts per million. And this project is also unique because there were a group of students who were helping with the product research and they were determining, they determined, I guess, that the declare labels offered the level and the type of ingredient disclosure that they were requiring. So here you've got not only the architect and the um, sustainability consultant um, working towards um, transparency documentation, but also some of the occupants, some of those that will be using the building. So we go from the fun of um, those projects and we forget easily the work that's been done and we move quickly on to the next challenge and never really reflect on the progress we've made but it's been really interesting to go through this process for this presentation to really do that and so here are some of the lessons that we learned along our transparency journey and i'm just going to highlight a few of them um, that you know the the voice of the customer i've said it several times really does matter but it takes time to develop these documents especially initially um, so i just want to mention that so if there's any other manufacturers who might be listening in um, just you know you might be starting just now and that it, you might be getting some pushback but i just want to emphasize that we had to lead from the middle to work with the entire organization to get over the finish line so don't stop at the no just keep asking and keep educating i think um, Anne did a, a great job at the end to say that education is going to be key and will continue to be key going forward and a benefit from this process for us was that it did expand our circle of stakeholders who were aware of these documents and you know they care now about the disclosures and what they can teach us and, and terry did a great job at the beginning of describing that they're really for us and especially for us they um, are helping us with in, with ingredient optimization and also to use the industry-wide EPDs. We don't yet have product specific, but we are definitely using the industry-wide EPDs as a tool for improvement. And in our case specifically right now, it's been water reduction. So ongoing, we are researching the impacts of ingredients through these transparency evaluations to ensure that we manufacture high quality products that meet our customers' requirements. So another, couple of things to you know wrap it up here is that you know all of all of these ideas are great but we have to keep the momentum going and we have to move this work forward so while on the screen here there might be some really obvious things like as as we've already most of us have already described that you know specifying and purchasing our products with transparency it's important we want to keep this work going and we need to know um, that we can through um, purchasing our products that have these disclosures so it's important to make the progress towards healthier buildings and reduced impacts of building materials which is the goal so continued collaboration between architects and manufacturers is key and one of National Gypsum's core statements is building products for a better future. So we believe that our transparency work is really aligned to that statement and we are contributing to healthy buildings and will continue to improve by reducing our manufacturing impacts. So that's it, thanks for attending. Please let us know how we can help you design and build better. Well, thank you so much. You really put a lot of effort into, both of you put a lot of effort into putting your stories together. And um, again, for the manufacturers who are on the call, putting these stories together for this webinar series is really a very productive and 
insightful process for the participants because, as Amy said, they'd never really pulled this story together. And so by going through the process, they really took the time to be able to evaluate the progress they've made, what they learned, uh, what the drivers were. And so manufacturers, you know, coming out of this presentation, you have a powerful presentation uh, to be able to use to continue your your work internally uh, and to educate your peers. So we're going to jump over to the catalog um, because we do want to help you specify, select and specify uh, all the manufacturers who have products in the transparency catalog. And I'm going to show you there's two ways to be able to find uh, manufacturers and, and their products. So I'm going to start first by showing you this handy master format filtering tool uh, right here at the top. And so let's say you're doing research on um, a project and you're, let's just say you're in the getting ready for specification. Um, right here from the very front page, you can select the master format division. You can even select which section you want to look at right now. Or you might say, you know what, I just want to see all of the manufacturers in division nine. And then I'm going to go section by section and drill down to find the manufacturers and, and the products that I want based on uh, the criteria that you want to apply in whatever order you want to, uh, to get to those results. So notice division nine is, is big. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in it. So there's uh, over 375 brands with over 3,000 products. And so now you can use this set of filters in, in any order you want. So obviously you can, you can page through things, which is kind of going to take forever. Um, or uh, you might say, well, geez, just show me all of the brands that are actually in this uh, division so that brand filter shows up. And of course, you can select the ones you want and just see those results. Um, or you might say, well, I'm working on a lead project. And before I even drill into any of these sections, uh, let's take a look at all of the uh, manufacturers who have products with EPDs. So you can filter it that way. And you might even say, you know, because I'm working on a lead project, I want to see all the manufacturers. And that, by the way, it filters down pretty significantly. It's down to 119 brands and 725 products. Uh, you might then say, well, show me the ones that also will earn me the material credit. And that's going to filter even further. Now it's 16 brands, 254 products, and you can see uh, all the brands uh, that are there. And um, both Flexco and National Gypsum, which is pretty awesome. Or you might say, uh, let me just drill into each section. And um, I'm going to show you how the filtering works. This is a big section, Division 90960, oh, uh, because there's a lot of different types of flooring. But we designed the filter uh, so two things could happen. One, that you might find brands that you're not familiar with. And two, that you might find solutions to the same application uh, that you're looking to specify products for that you didn't know existed. So let's say uh, you're looking at flooring. So now everything in 0960 uh, is, is displayed, 132 brands, over 1,000 products. Now you as a user might say, yeah, I'm not looking for specialty flooring right now. I'm not looking for masonry. Oh, good. Here's wood flooring. I can see there's different types of that. I'm going to come back and look at that. But maybe what I really want to do is look at resilient flooring. So I'm going to turn off terrazzo and I'm going to turn off fluid, carpet, and access. And now I'm just looking at resilient flooring, which is actually um, a pretty significant uh, section as well. Um, and... We'll give the catalog a minute to think about it. Um, 
And now you can see there's still 69 brands, 439 products, and you can, again, apply any of those filters. Or you could start to scroll, and you're going to see, well, oh, look, here's Flexco. And maybe you've actually never heard of Flexco, uh, but you can see they've got some pretty good stuff. And you might say, let me learn more about Flexco. So you're going to go right here to the Flexco listing. And what you're going to be able to do is uh, if I click here, you're going to go right to the Flexco website. And for the manufacturers and AECs who are on the call, the transparency catalog is designed to ultimately send you back to the manufacturer's website. We don't actually believe manufacturers should have to manage a lot of content about their products in the transparency catalog. Really, the transparency catalog is designed to really simplify information uh, in a very compact way so you can access what you need when you want it. But you're going to go to the manufacturer's website to really find all the detail that you're looking for. Here's an opening statement. Um, this actually, we're using this in SEO. This is going to be the statement that shows up when somebody does searching. Again, the ability to contact either email or phone number. Manufacturers can add whatever they like. This goes back to this letter writing campaign and, and the helping close the loop to help you let manufacturers know that when you specify or select any one of these products with transparency information, you're going to be able to let them know. And I actually quit out of my email during this uh, presentation, but this link right here, uh, it's going to pop up an email with Anne's address in it. It's going to go directly to Anne uh, because she wants to hear from you. If you have questions about the transparency or she just wants to hear from you, are you selecting or specifying any of these products with transparency information? And then you're going to go down here and you're going to see they have four, five master format sections. You can see they have multiple sections of resilient tile. What we do is we use the master format terminology for the section and we append the manufacturer's brand name so you can see what manufacturers call their products in, in that section. And you can browse their products section by section or you can open and look at the listing all at the same time. This is super, super handy, not only for uh, AECs, but for manufacturers, sales reps, distributors, partners to be able to, in a glance, uh, see what the manufacturer has. And then, you know, if you're interested in a product, you're going to go right there to the manufacturer's website. You can get the EPD. It's right there, too. Um, what we do is we correlate every disclosure the manufacturer has to the products that it goes with. So there's no more guessing anymore. When you find an EPD or an HPD, how many families or SKUs does it cover? So we've done all that alignment. And now you're also going to be able to find uh, information about embodied carbon, if that's a tool that you're going to be using to make decisions. Um, and you can see that this particular product is in the 40th percentile of all products in this category. And we have this handy tool tip that we've pretty much condensed the whole EC3 methodology into an explanation of how they're calculating the embodied carbon. And if you want to do more, you're going to be able to click right here into the EC3 tool, right to uh, that EPD in the EC3 tool, and you'll be able to uh, actually start doing any other kinds of comparisons or adding it to uh, projects. And if you've come in through the EC3 tool, every manufacturer who's in the transparency catalog uh, you're going to be able to get back to the manufacturer's listing from every EPD page in the EC3 catalog because we are effectively uh, connecting the last mile of people in the EC3 tool to be able to contact the manufacturer and get all that information. And right there, you're going to find the three-part spec for each section. Uh, and in this case, it's going to take you to Flexco's specification page so you can download it. Most of the other listings that actually would download the spec document itself. Um, and it depends on what the manufacturer has. And for all of the manufacturers who are in the transparency catalog, uh, and we'll quickly go to 
national gypsum for all of the manufacturers who are product master spec customers uh, we are linking that product master spec document so that section right there so you can download the three-part spec there it is it's just launching word which i quit out of but uh, there it is there's the spec document and um Anyone who has come in through the product master spec site will be able to uh, find all of the specs there. And uh, very shortly, the Dell Tech folks will add a logo to the transparency catalog. So we are, we are linking back and forth. Anyway, that really brings us to the top of the hour. And I want to thank everybody who came today uh, to learn about National Gypsum and Flexco. We encourage you to find out more, go to their listings in the catalog, use the catalog. It's free. There's no login. You don't have to set up an account. And we uh, encourage you to give us some feedback on your way out. And we look forward to you attending the next webinar in July, uh, which I think we're going to be able to announce that it will be Havelock Wool and Excel Dryer two also very cool companies. So wish everyone a great day, enjoy the summer, and uh, Anne, thank you. Anne and Amy did a great job. Thanks, Terry. Take care, thank everybody. You. All right, bye-bye.